Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am here with my esteemed colleagues today, and uh, we are here to talk about integrative and lifestyle medicine in physical therapy. I am very excited to welcome not one, not two, but three authors that have contributed to the text Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine in Physical Therapy, and I want to jump right in and introduce them so we can get started with our conversation. First, I want to introduce Dr. Brett Nielsen. He is a PT and super nerd with two doctorates, uh, a DPT and is uh, DSC. And he's also board certified um, in orthopedics and fellowship trained in orthopedic manual therapy. He's admissions director and assistant professor of uh, Hawaii uh, University's doctor, Hawaii Pacific University's doctor of PT program. He has published, he has peer reviewed articles, he has presented at state and national conferences. He's very focused on research that attends to the intersection between sleep and pain. And he continues also because he has spare time to practice in clinical care in the state of Washington uh, for in home outpatient PT. So not busy at all. Um, <laughs> moving on, we have uh, Dr. Jesse. Um, Padalek, who received her MPT and um, DPT degrees. She's been teaching pain neuroscience education and manual therapy in continuing ed for a decade and has served as the program director for Evidence in Motion's Pain Science Fellowship. She's participated in and led research exploring the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors of middle, middle school students related to pain, emphasizing healthy options to address pain when it inevitably occurs. Um, she owns and operates her community's first direct pay PT practice, seeing a variety of patients, acute, chronic care, kind of across the spectrum, and she has special interests in complex and chronic pain, manual therapy, Pilates, spine and running injuries. And finally, we have Dr. Adrian Lowe, who um, has his undergrad, master's and PhD in physiotherapy um, from the University of Stellenbosch in Cape Town. South Africa, one of my favorite places in the whole entire world. He is adjunct faculty at St. Ambrose University and the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, teaching pain science. He has taught everywhere. That's pretty much his amazing bio for 25 years at numerous conferences um, in pain science on manual therapy and uh, has co-authored and authored over 100 peer reviewed, reviewed articles related to spinal disorders and pain science. Um, he completed his PhD on pain neuroscience education and is the director of the Therapeutic Neuroscience Research Group, which is an independent collaborative initiative studying pain neuroscience. He is also senior faculty because he has spare time too, pain science director and vice president of faculty experience for evidence in motion. And now we can all exhale. Um, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for co contributing um, the pain chapter in um, our text. Um, we're really excited to have included this chapter and I want to talk to you about that and, and just a num numerous other things um, in our time together today. So I have a question because this is a question I often get and it's one I'm really curious about and that is what made you choose PT to begin with? And just jump in, feel free to jump in. I blame my mom. <laughs> she, she thought that I would be good at it. She worked in a clinic and I heard the word therapy and I didn't, at, in my high school brain, I thought that just meant people laying on couches, talking to psychologists. I'm like, I don't want to do that. And so she said, no physical therapy. And she dragged me to work with her one day. And I watched the PT Frank helping a post stroke um, patient in the parallel bars. And I was, I was there for five minutes and I'm like, yep, that that's what I want to do. Wow. How old were you? I was, uh, I was a sophomore in college and I was considering pharmacology at the time. And so I knew I wanted to do something in health. I liked science. So yeah. Was your mom a PT? Nope. She was an aide. She was support staff. Oh, she worked wow. her butt off. So oh, yeah. um, she was a, she's a great mom. Oh, so. wow. And yeah, the unsung heroes, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a great story. Yep. She was a farmer too. Oh, <laughs> oh wonderful. <laughs> My people. <laughs> yes. 
Brett, are you next? Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, let's see. I I come, my, my mom's a nurse, um, my aunt's an OT, and then I have two cousins that are OTs, and one of them is my aunt's daughter. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, therapy and healthcare was always something that, uh, you know, I thought I might want to do. Um, I quickly learned that engineering wasn't quite the right fit for me. I wanted something more active. I didn't want to sit at a desk all day. Um, I thought about becoming a physician, but I was like, that's just far too much schooling. Um, so physical therapy sounds like the right balance and fit. And, uh, I think what's really funny is that I'm I'm a lifelong learner, and I don't think that I've really stopped going to school since I've been a physical therapist. Um, and so my rationale for not becoming a physician was, while probably a, a great choice, was a really poor rationale um, because I've done just as much schooling. So um, <laughs> here we are today. Oh my gosh! Wow! All these um, family members in healthcare. Well, the good news is I don't have anybody in healthcare. That's good. So I should have listened to them probably. <laughs> um, you know, Ginger, people have asked me that for so many years. Um, I'm just going to be blunt. Uh, the reason I got into PT school was I was too dumb for medical school. Um, I applied, couldn't get in. And, um, you know, the funny thing is I had no idea what PTs were doing. Um, I knew about medicine. I knew about sports, both of those. So they go hand in hand, right? And um, I remember going to PT school and within the first semester, I was like, I don't understand any of this stuff. I don't know what it is, but it's pretty cool. And um, so I actually fell in love with PT while in PT school. So I, there was no, this is the higher calling. This is no, I'm going to change the world, make the world a better place. It was just more of a, as I went through the process, I was like, wow, this is cool. I just got a patient out of bed and, oh, this is cool. I, somebody can raise their arm better when they left here. And it wasn't me, it was my instructors. And that, that got my attention. So, um, yeah, it was pretty simple. And, and here we are, what, many, many years later. So, and, and right. very, yeah. What a way to, to land into your passion, you know? I, I thought I was actually going to go to law school. <laughs> Not too late. <laughs> I know. If it wasn't so expensive in the United States, it would be a good combination because and we'll get to this later. But um, I know you guys are uh, big believers in advocacy as well. And I think that's where it came from. So, like, the passion never left. I want to help people get better, but there's also this policy side that kind of plagues us and that we all, always need to be involved in. But we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Um, what do you think that, and this this is kind of you're up to your interpretation um, on this question. It can be, you know, where, where your passion is in physical therapy. Obviously, pain neuroscience is a big deal. Um, but it also can be, you know, a, a particular favorite thing or story about physical therapy um for those who are listening who may be interested in pt or maybe just you know want to get to know more about you know your origin story and um how you ended up where you did how long is this webinar <laughs> <laughs> how much time do we have <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I have no problem going first. Um, if you would have told me 30 years ago, I was going to sit and talk to people about chronic pain, I would have said you're out of your mind. There's no way anyway. Um, I had a big love for acute care therapy, uh, worked in intensive care units, ICU, um, emergency departments, love the whole acute care thing for that matter. Um, and, and again, a, a twist of faith. Um, in South Africa, our training is different. So if you don't pass um, your PT degree, you got to spend another six months in training. And I did not, I did not pass my final exam. And um, which at that point was a terrible disaster in my life. Only to sit here 30 years later going, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because in the six months that I got retrained, more training because I wasn't smart enough, um, I had an instructor that took me under her wing. And, and that's where I fell in love with spinal manual therapy, uh, clinical reasoning, all this stuff, including some pain, early, early pain stuff. And um, then once I started practicing, I I was very orthopedically trained and I again failed. I mean, <laughs> this sounds like one failure story, but I couldn't help people with chronic pain. So I remember going to South Africa on a trip, telling my instructors how utterly useless they are because I don't know what to do with these people that are complex. And they shoved a few papers in my face. I read it, I came back. I'm like, this is pretty cool stuff. And um, the rest is history. So again, it's, it's not a failure. It's a, you know, we often hit a, a roadblock and then we think it's a terrible thing, but it takes us another direction. And um, utterly excited about what I'm doing. Um, 
just, you know, Jess and Brett is here. I work with him a lot. And, you know, the things we're doing is amazing, but I would never have ended up here, Ginger, not even close. I would have been just a good old orthotherapist going in Monday to Friday, do my thing and you no, know, nothing more than a joint, a muscle, a tendon and a ligament. And there's nothing wrong knowing those, but um, there's so much more out there than that. So um, yeah, it's probably a quick and easy way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't remember who said experience is the name we give to our mistakes or our failures. And I've always remembered that because um, I don't consider failures to be failures, just like, you know, in your experience. So I, I come back to that quote quite often. Um, and it's also really inspiring to hear um, your stories to other other kids out there who are interested in PT or you thinking that they're experiencing failures when really it's just it's experience. We all move forward based on experience. Yeah, I can go next I, um, on that because it's the, it's a similar thread as I had been practicing for about a decade and had a lot of extensive training in manual therapy and Pilates. And so I thought if only we've had the perfect structure and alignment and the greatest core strength, um, these patients should be getting better. And it was good training. And I, you know, I started to get confident in my hands. I was helping, you know, a lot of people, but there was this segment of the patient population that I would just kept falling flat on my face with no matter how hard I tried. And I just, I wanted to help them, but I just was hitting this roadblock. And I started thinking, I think I, I must really stink at this. Maybe it's time to hang it up. Uh, you know, I had paid off my student loans. This was back in the day when school wasn't so expensive. It took me a decade to get those things paid off. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll go work at Subway and be a sandwich artist now because it was really bothering me. I thought I was not doing well. And about that time, the transitional DPT was coming around. And so I was getting students who were having, you know, degrees that were exceeding mine. I thought, well, I'm either going to level up and, and get with the program, or I'm going to kind of go work at Subway. And someone mentioned um, Regis University. One of my competitors down the street had gone for her TPD, TDPT through Regis and, and Tim Flynn. And so she started kind of poking at me. And that's the program that I went um, with. And during that course, course management of a lumbar spine. This was 15 plus years ago. Tim talked about, we had a whole week on the biopsychosocial approach. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is that subset. And somebody said, has anybody, have you ever, Jess, you seem really interested. This was hybrid learning back in the early days. Jess, you know, you seem really interested in this pain, this biopsychosocial stuff. Have you ever gone to a pain neuroscience education class? And I said, no. And so I looked up and lo and behold, Adrian was teaching in Minneapolis down the street from me for 90 miles away. And it was like, the next weekend. So I quick signed up for Minnesota APTA, went to PE class, T &E, um, that he was teaching and um, explained pain. And it was like, oh, the heavens opened up and the doves flitted down. And I was like, this is it. So between um, Tim's take on manual therapy um, and the biopsychosocial, and then hearing um, PE, it was like, okay, I'm not going to be a sandwich artist. I can do this. But it's a lot more complex than I ever give it credit for. And then Adrian got me turned on to those couple uh, articles by Isle Lederman, the fall of the structural model and the myth of core stability. And I was like, oh my gosh, this was a big <laughs> paradigm shift, but it was really good. It was, um, it was really good both and versus either or thinking. So it was a good paradigm shift and I was ready for it, but it took a decade of failures. So. Sorry, James. <laughs> Gosh, <clears throat> I, my story has elements of, of both of what's been shared um, by Adrian and, and Jess. And um, I think, you know, I got out of PT school and I, I, I suffered from new grad physical therapy syndrome, um, which is I felt like manual therapy could cure anybody. Um, I received a, a really heavy dose of manual therapy training in my undergraduate, thankfully, um, and uh, I thought that was the the end all be all. And, you know, I found out really, really quickly that you can't just walk in and, and treat a knee or treat a spine, right? That these body parts are connected to a whole person. And it was a big wake up call when I had some patients that, wow, they did so well with, you know, manual therapy and exercise and they got better really quick and easy. And it was a lot of fun. And then on the flip side, I'd have a very similar patient who, 
you know, should be responding in the exact same way. And they were not. Um, and I, at, at that point in time, I was missing, right. I was missing this whole person approach. Um, and so I think through, you know, training and, um, you know, connections with other, you know, leaders and, and physical therapists in our, our profession, I started realizing, you know, the, my limitations and how complex pain was and how individualized it was. Um, and it was, you know, meeting people like Tim Flynn and, and others. And then, you know, Adrian, I think really kind of put the pieces together uh, when I met him, I think back in 2015 ish, um, just kind of put the pieces together. Like, oh my gosh, like I felt kind of like on an Island, like I'm the only one who's kind of seeing these things. And I quickly very, you know, realized that, uh, no, this is, you know, everybody. And it's only those who are being inquisitive in, in really looking at their outcomes and, and looking at and asking those questions of why isn't this person doing well when they should be, um, you know, I think that's kind of what kind of steered my trajectory away from, you know, a very manual therapy heavy focus into more of a holistic um, treatment approach uh, for, for my patients and, you know, kind of fed into uh, other avenues of, of my career so far. So. Oh, you guys are like, speaking my story. Um, I was an athletic trainer first, actually a personal trainer. Um, knowing I was going to PT school, athletic training was like, yeah, this looks kind of similar. I'm going to do this on the way, you know, to PT school. So athletic training was next and um, very manual therapy. So, you know, it's all ortho sports, um, covering swimming, baseball, all of it, football. And I was launched into as a baby PT um, in 1998. And I didn't know it at the time, but it was the number three county for the opioid epidemic or would become that over the next 15 years as I, I lived there 21 years. And, um, and so I quickly realized, oh, really, holy crap. Uh, the stuff that I learned in PT school is, it's not enough. It's not working. Um, and I was very overwhelmed. Um, Jesse, it reminds me of your story. Like I thought I am doing the wrong thing here. You know, I'm, I don't feel effective at what I'm, what I'm doing. I feel burned out, frankly, you know, you know, probably, you know, depressed too. Anyway, long story short, that's kind of, you know, my trajectory into um, what we're talking about today, integrative and lifestyle medicine. Um, so it's a pretty good segue to go into the next piece of that. Taking your stories, we have really similar backgrounds of um, coming from somewhere else and then being faced with realities in the system of epidemic chronic pain and chronic disease and figuring out, whoa, this, this isn't um, polio of the 20th century, you know, an acute care physical therapy. We've got a whole different population to deal with now. So I'm wondering, um, what really piqued your interest? You know, you all had amazing stories of coming out of what we know as the regular physical therapy kind of um, biomedical model <laughs> into a biopsychosocial model, into um, a P and E for informed model. But then, what flipped? You know, what tripped your trigger? What went? You know, uh, sent you over into the integrative lifestyle medicine realm in addition to? I'll, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I started, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting and I think I kind of found this route more for my own personal health. I mean, as <clears throat> you know, we're, we're all aging and you go for your annual physicals and, um, you know, your doctor's saying, oh, your blood pressure's looking pretty high and maybe it's start time to put you on some blood pressure medications, my family history, et cetera. And I just, you know, felt like, gosh, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be another way than just taking a pill, right? Um, as a PT, I know that, you know, pills have a lot of shortcomings and there's a lot more benefit to movement and exercise, you know, movement is medicine. So I, I felt like, gosh, there's got to be something. And I don't remember how I stumbled across it, but really my first introduction was um, the book by uh, uh, Dr. Michael Greger, um, How Not to Die, mm -hmm. and a, a fantastic book on nutrition and the, you know, the value and, and just uh, loaded with evidence. So he's like speaking my language. And so I kind of figured out, you know, who is this, this author? 
and found out that he's tied into the you know lifestyle medicine um, group. And I just kind of started following that. Um, and, and so that kind of then kind of spurred into other, you know, areas of reading, you know, the obesity code and other books that really kind of started to shape my understanding of the whole person. Right. And if I really, you know, started thinking about it, I'm like, gosh, in order to be a healthy, well-functioning human being, you need to be, you know, uh, getting movement and, and, and exercise, right. You can't be, you've got to be, you know, physically in shape. You've got to be, you know, getting decent sleep, um, how important that is. Um, you've got to be eating pretty well. Um, and then you've got to have some good social support around you, whether it's a job, something that gets you dry, you know, driven and wakes you up, um, or, you know, gives you motivation to get out of bed in the morning. Right. And then I started reflecting how many of my patients, like, you know, are struggling with those things. And am I asking about those things? And am I being inquisitive enough? You know, I'm asking them a lot about their movement, but am I really considering, are they sleeping well? Um, are they eating well? And then, you know, putting two and two together, I'm going, gosh, maybe these are some of the recipes for why some of my patients are doing well um, and getting better with just physical, you know, standard physical therapy, manual therapy, exercise, et cetera. And others really aren't. Um, and then lastly, having kids, having kids, you know, really uh, makes you experience some of these things, right? Sleep deprivation and how looking at how I function as a human being when I'm sleep deprived, not getting good sleep, getting multiple wake ups, and I am not my best version of myself. And gosh, yeah, it would make sense that I'm not creating a, an environment for, you know, say recovery in this stance. So maybe there's other things we need to be addressing with our patients before we get straight to the movement component. So that's kind of my, my, uh, a bit of a journey. So. So I can share next. Um, I would say a lot of the, my interest and passion in integrative lifestyle medicine, um, comes out of pain science. We teach, um, P and E plus it's not just understanding why we hurt. It's what are the things that are going to take that understanding, make movement safe and make the rest of the pieces come together. And we, you know, we talk about pillars, sleep being one of them, goal setting, knowledge, movement. So there's certainly overlap and, and being, you know, an, an instructor, um, you know, we just think our, our patients need to know the top of the iceberg. We need to know the bottom of the iceberg. So that lifelong learning, that inquisitiveness, what's the big deal? Why is Adrian so worked up about this sleep stuff and what's these things. And so just reading, um, more on sleep, one of the probably the most impactful books for me was Matthew Walker's, uh, why we sleep actually it was my kid who got me turned on to that said, mom, I think you'd like this guy. Um, so he was in the, in the, in the middle school study, um, pilot group. So he, he knows that I'm interested. So I think the, the curiosity that lifelong learner um, nutrition has always been, I think for many people, just a lifelong journey of experimenting, watching one documentary and going a year being a vegan and then watching another one and swing the pendulum to a paleo and then watching another one. And so the curiosity has always been there, but pain science has really pulled it together. And when you think about what, um, what helps a person kind of work their way slowly, methodically out of the deep pit of chronic pain is also those very same things that take a person with maybe average health and then help them thrive, right? So it's the same stuff. It's just the starting point is a little bit different. So the more we understand the pillars, the stuff, um, I think the better we can have our own health and those of the patients that we're treating and yeah. So, and Adrian will pick on me because, but right, Adrian, I do not send emails at 11 PM. <laughs> you used to. <laughs> oh, zing. <laughs> Matthew um, Walker yeah, scared yeah. the heck out of me with that. So yeah, so first, yeah. So first Brett, I don't understand this whole not sleeping when you have kids thing. I slept really good during our kids. You may want to talk to my wife about that. Um, yeah, I mean, Ginger, I, I think I feel now like the whole table has been inverted. I'm the newbie. 
Um, so yeah, my world is pain science. Adrian knows a little bit more about pain than most other things, but um, for me, that's the exact opposite. Um, I so you know, you talk about South Africa. Um, in South Africa, we don't do a lot of pills, surgery, drugs, whatever. That's not a common thing. So I always grew up with the idea that there's healthier ways to do what we do, not because you know, people are healthy. It's just, we don't do the other side. You don't inject, you don't drug, you don't cut and all those things. And so when I came here, I put it this way, it's always been in the back of my mind that there's gotta be a better way, but I've never overtly believed or did anything about it. And then, you know, you start teaching pain science long enough and you start attracting all these weird people to the classes, right? Like Jesse and Brett and all these. And they started hammering away at things like sleep and nutrition and all this stuff, you know, you know, what is mindfulness based stress reduction? It's, just, it's a very long word for something. It's simple, right? You got to be mindful. And so it, it, for me, the world was the other way around. It was like, well, there's this weird stuff on the side that all these weird people do. And then um, truth be told, there's this group would attest to the, the, the science behind it has just exploded. I mean, I, I may be many things or whatever, but um, I love good research. And when I start seeing the data coming out with mindfulness-based stress reduction, with sleep, nutrition and stuff, you're like, you, you'd be an, an idiot. It's probably not the right word on a webinar or whatever, but you'd be a total idiot to sit there and go, well, that, that, that's not that powerful. If we see what sleep does and nutrition, all these things, whatever. So the cool thing is my students became my educators because people show up at a class. I teach them about pain and during the break, we sit and chat and they talk about mindfulness based stress reduction like well tell me more and then before you know it go read this paper so I was the exact opposite and if anybody went since they threw out a book I might as well say that I mean way back I mean um, Robert Sapolsky's book why zebras don't get ulcers for me was a very cool read because hey, it's from Africa so I, I, I am from Africa but it was really cool to understand stress biology as a manual therapist to understand that wait a minute um, stress and what it does to a human being and all that kind of cool stuff so we yeah, anyway, uh, so I would argue today you're interviewing probably two lifestyle medicine people and a very green young lifestyle medicine person is very intrigued by it. Um, and I'm so well on my journey to understand all the nuances and details of it. So, yeah. Oh, gosh, um, I love your stories because there's one thread through them all, and that's the that kids are the best teachers. <laughs> I know my kids are, and they continue to um, they continue to push my buttons in the ways that I know that I need to either improve on myself, right, or apply what I know um, in various ways. Sleep is the easiest because kids tend to steal the most of that. <laughs> There's no more lingering on a Saturday morning with your cup of coffee. <laughs> it's more like finding the cup of coffee at noon and going, "Wait, what happened?" You know. I need an afternoon nap. Um, but we do learn so much from the kids. I think they teach us more than we teach them. And I think there's two, one, two things that I want to point out about that. Um, one, I feel like that's the reason that, you know, I didn't call, but I emailed. So I emailed Joe and said, gosh, you know, there's not a book on this. We really, we really should consider doing that. <clears throat> And the reason, one of the big reasons that I felt strongly about the book, the idea of the book was to help the future clinicians out there, the PTs that come behind us, the kids that feel like, can we, can we practice integrative medicine? Is that in our scope? Can we practice lifestyle medicine? Is that in our scope? And overwhelmingly, I wanted them to know absolutely, yes, 150%, it's in our professional scope of practice. It may, you may not feel like it's in your personal scope, but go go vet the evidence, go read, go learn, go take a course, but it's absolutely within our scope. Um, but there's one issue with that, and that is our PTs today face a bunch of challenges that it's school is more expensive, school is longer, there's dwindling reimbursement, there's all of these issues, there's salaries that aren't commensurate with, you know, being a having a being doctorally prepared. So those are the things swirling around in my head. Um, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are that face uh, physical therapy and our future PTs out there? I'll, I'll jump in as a as a PT educator. Um, yeah, I mean, the, this is a, a complex issue. And Ginger, you touched, you know, highlighted on some of the, the big things, right? Which is the cost of education continues to rise the 
PT salaries are pretty flat and, and constant, um, as is, you know, reimbursement rates and cost of living is going up. So there is going to be a tipping point at some point in time where demand and, and less, you know, students either want to come into PT or they exit PT really early because the financial component of it just doesn't make sense. So I think that's a huge, one huge issue is the money side of things. I think the other side of things too, is that, um, you know, what, what's being taught in PT school, uh, today, they have to learn so much of the foundations, um, but are they really getting contemporary uh, expertise and contemporary knowledge and, and tools that they're going to be able to use? As an example, most programs have very little, if if any, content dedicated to lifestyle medicine type of, um, uh, you know, even knowledge and understanding, let alone interventions. And as long as CAPD, which is oftentimes thought of to be 10 years behind, and as long as programs have to continue to teach to CAPD standards, um, it doesn't allow them the opportunity to really expand and push this uh, profession forward. Um, you know, I'm excited that at our program, it's a, a bit of, it's a, it's a balancing act. Yes, we've got to meet all these standards and make sure we're covering you know, what CAPT is requiring, but then what is the high value um, contemporary information and skills that we can teach our, our, our students uh, so that they are exiting our program, um, you know, with the best available knowledge and, and at least the tools to understand where they need to go next uh, to, to seek out additional uh, learning opportunities. So, um, but yeah, it's a complex one. I'm, I'm excited to hear what uh, Jesse and Adrian uh, have to share as well. Well, I would say one thing that um, I hear from students and from learners from not not on, uh, not in the academic arena, but our, our working um, continuing ed type of PTs out there is just the, the daily clinic grind that changes the the demand to do more with less. Um, you know, the the creative things that businesses have to do to just keep the lights on because of um, dwindling reimbursement. Um, you know, one of my heroes is Anna Lemke, um, psychologist who wrote Dopamine Nation and some others. I love her. And she coined this term, the Toyotaization of medicine. At least I think it was her who talked about this happening in the medical sphere where, um, you know, um, healthcare be kind of kind of became health business and physicians had to churn them out, right? Productivity is looked at. And in that, there needed to be quick solutions and quick answers. And that fed into the opioid epidemic. On the PT side of it, I think there are some um, clinicians who still get to enjoy that. I always ask, how, how long do you have with patients? Do you still have your 30 minutes to 45? How long do you get for an eval? But some are just crunching down, crunching down, crunching down. And when you think about that contemporary model, like to really delve in and kind of find out how is somebody sleeping? What is their stress? What's their social support? What's their nutrition? Those are, those are each, you know, sometimes really detailed conversations. And if you're trying to wedge them into shorter and shorter and shorter visits, it's a recipe for um, this kind of feeling of, I, I just don't have the time to, to, do for this patient what really they need. So I think the model um, is, is not always conducive and that can cause a lot of burnout and a lot of discouragement, knowing there's so much that we could do and we only have four visits. That's all that's authorized. And they're only, you know, we get 20 minutes max by the time the person is in or out or whatever. So I think that just some of the realities of health business um, are, they're, they're demoralizing some of our caregivers out there. Absolutely. And preventing us from even delivering the care that would be effective mm -hmm. because 20 minutes doesn't allow for that. There's no magic wand that's going to, you know, provide the kind of outcomes we need if we only get 20 minutes or whatever the time frame may be for, for patients. Brett, you mentioned a, 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 an important point too, before we get to Adrian's response, which is, um, uh, one thing just to keep on our back burner, and maybe you want to answer it now is, you know, at in your program, uh, in Pacific, the Pacific Hawaii program, is that correct? Yeah, Hawaii Pacific University. Hawaii Pacific <laughs> University. Um, when I first read it, I was like, 
HPU, that's High Point University because we have another DPT program down the street, uh, different, different HPU. Um, where does ILM fit into the current curriculum if it does? Is there a class for it? Is there an elective? Um, it's <clears throat> bits and pieces of it are um, kind of threaded through multiple different courses from, um, you know, from our, our pain science course to our advanced therapeutic interventions course um, and, and a few others. Uh, so, but there is not a dedicated, you know, course to integrative lifestyle medicine. Um, and I, I think that's a, you know, it's, it's a contemporary thing that uh, hopefully is, is coming. Um, and I know there's, multiple different ways. You don't necessarily have to have a specific course on it, right? Um, there's multiple different ways of delivering the content. Um, but, uh, you know, I think allowing the space for those topics uh, to occur is is really, really important as well. So. Yeah, it is. Uh, Adrian, what's your wisdom on this? Oh, my goodness. Um, everything they said. Um, yeah, I, you know, for me, it just comes down to one word is money. I'm sorry, but money fixes a lot of the problems we have. If students don't have debt um, as much as they do, if we get better reimbursement, um, yeah, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, if you want to build a lifestyle medicine course for PT schools tomorrow and get Blue Cross starting Monday to reimburse a thousand dollars a minute for lifestyle medicine treatments, it'll be in the schools tomorrow. It'll be in private practice. It's all driven by reimbursement. We were just at CSM last week and everything, the fanciest robotics in the world, the most incredible VR or whatever, none of it matters because guess what, you can't get paid for it. The list goes on, right? And so the one that I just would add, and I think um, you guys have all mentioned it, um, you jokingly said, Ginger, earlier, Adrian's been everywhere. I feel like I've been everywhere. I've been training tens of thousands of people all over the world. And the one thing that does concern me on the weekends, I see a lot of tired therapists um, they themselves, they're tired, they don't sleep, they don't exercise, they don't hydrate enough. And now, again, this is not the best example, but it, it concerns me when our best resource we have, which is the human being that sits in front of us that went through years of training, is not taking care of themselves either. Because I would argue that if I showed up in the clinic and I was I was ready, I was energized, I'm, 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 I'm hydrating well, I'm, I'm eating well, I'm sleeping well, I probably could handle a little bit more in the clinic than I can if I'm not. And so I f just find so many tired therapists. And then, oh, heaven forbid, let's give up our weekends for continuing education and therapy only, right? It's, the list goes on. I mean, we're, we're, but, um, it's work-life balance. Um, it is taking care of yourself. But man, if, if we found money somewhere, better reimbursement models, um, those kind of things. That's why the stuff that Jesse is doing as a, as a, as a standalone you know, practice, um, uh, uh, I think is amazing. I think we need to get something better going, but we all know it. And, and it's, it's a common thing, but... Uh, yeah, it, it boils down to money. It really does. If we got more of it and we owed less of it, and um, if things would change drastically, we all know it. So, yeah. so true. You guys have brought up so many relevant issues of um, being in business. If you're insurance based, dwindling reimbursements. If you are a cash based private pay, um, you still have to <clears throat> do everything from uh dusting your countertops to mopping the floors to making sure those yoga mats are clean to hiring you know doing payroll and i have a private practice as well that's it's cash based and so i'm just listing all the stuff that i do in a week <laughs> and then the problem with um being burned out or the potential burnout of and i can't believe i were all of you guys at csm and i just missed all of you last week oh, so sad about that I saw so many people every corner I would round, I would see another person and yet we didn't run into each other next year in Boston. Um, Ginger, but, can, I, yeah. can I jump in and make one, one more comment on this topic before we shift gears? Yeah. Um, because I think I 100% agree with Adrian that money drives everything, but I think that practice you know, also drives. And, and so if we can attack this more from a practice perspective, meaning if more clinicians can integrate in, integrative lifestyle medicine concepts into practice, and we can have evidence to support it, that then can drive money. And the same at the same token, that then informs CAPTI standards and education. And so I think this can be a multi, I, I don't think we should sit, sit around waiting for the money to happen, right? Because I think we can all agree 
on this call that, that it ain't happening. Um, but we can start to address it through um, education and through practice and through research, which then should drive the money. Um, and, and I think that's going to be really important, um, it, you know, uh, something to consider. Uh, just one other example, Hawaii Pacific University has a um, uh, a health promotion course, which is fantastic, and it starts to address some of these things, um, but it really talks more about the well person. And so I think there's that blend of also, you know, seeing the whole person from the beginning point all the way through the full, you know, end of the spectrum. So I just wanted to add in those couple things. Yeah, that last thing you said is so important of seeing them through from beginning to end. And that brings up an imp another important point of um, what I felt was really um, a driver or catalyst for the book. And that is letting PTs know existing and future PTs that um, we are across the lifespan providers, we should be frontline providers. And currently, we're not viewed as that by the public. And it's a very good segue into um, the next question, which is, you know, centered around solutions. So of course, one of the solutions is we we write more books, we write more book chapters, we we do more paper, we write more papers, we do more research. Um, but what are the things that you have identified, because it sits heavy on our hearts, seeing the next generation of PTs saddled with debt and feeling like things could be bleak, while at the same time they are super excited about what they're learning because they know that they're going to make a difference what would we say, what would you say, how do you think we can overcome or navigate the challenges that we just talked about? And Brett, your, your last comments were a great segue into, you know, into this question. I think um, one thing, you know, just as advice for, you know, probably PT students, you, you don't get into a PT program unless you are a hard worker or you have, you know, you've proven, you know, you've been able to pass certain um, academic rigors that allow you to get into um, school. So I think we tend to draw a very high performing um, lot, which is great, but it has that shadow side of um, push, 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 push through, push through, push through. And having this expectation of ourselves that we're just gonna, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. And so it kind of comes back to that self care um, that, you know, it's okay sometimes to hit a pause button or to ask for help or to reach out. And I do think that the younger folks are probably better at that than I ever was. Um, uh, but if you push too hard too long, you inevitably just hit this wall. <laughs> And it's almost like it's too late. And yeah. so just reaching out earlier and asking for help, making your concerns known, known um, staying curious. So I think that as much as, as we can, just to keep people in as best self-care, which again is our lifestyle medicine tools. So it's not, it, it, I really think of lifestyle medicine, especially some of the um, mindfulness-based stress reduction, meditation, meditation, those, you, you don't learn that book knowledge that is experiential knowledge. You don't know yoga because you watched a class. You you experience Pilates and yoga in your body. So the embodied practice of some of the things that were so you know as Brett is making up his next class, I know he will because he has already in the fellowship integrating in little practices so that 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 we can experience them. See what fits. Try on breath work. Don't wait till you're at the, you know, smashing your head into a wall to integrate some of these things. Yeah, you know, I can't remember which author. Um, I read an article or a book and I can't remember which author this was, but they pen, they gave it a, this, they gave it a phrase of the phraseology they used to describe what you were talking about was the dark side of resilience. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we often think about that because in popular media, I've got all kinds of books on my shelf in front of me about resilience, resilience, just have more grit, just lean in, just keep pushing, right? But there's very much a dark side to that. And I think that, yes, it's type S, type A PTs that are driven, 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 um, often don't ask for help until like when I'm teaching yoga, I will talk about don't put your face into the windshield where you can't make any adjustments in a yoga pose because your face is already smashed into the windshield, you know. 
um, back up so you can see what you're doing and make little small adjustments. So I think that message is such a good one that we have to be aware of the dark side of resilience. Resilience isn't all great. Really good point. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I, I think of a lot of things that are happening in lifestyle medicine is what we went through in pain for the last 15 to 20, 30 years. Um, you know, I heard for the longest time there's a pain revolution, there's a pain revolution, and yeah, maybe there was, I wasn't invited, but um, the last 10 years, 15 years has been insane. Um, and it's actually very comforting going to CSM where there's thousands of um, therapists and then sessions that are just going bonkers over pain science, right? And I think the same thing will happen with lifestyle medicine. Um, sometimes we just need to let it grow, let it let it water it, let it, let it take its... Now, will there be sessions on lifestyle and be, uh, medicine? Absolutely. But we're going to start seeing sleep in this session and, and, and motivational interviewing here. And, and little pieces will start splintering out. But I think the message is definitely happening by itself. The one thing I would ask, and, and I'm probably going to get flack for this one, is I just, I'm just asking the um, lifestyle medicine folks to make sure we keep doing research about it. Um, because one of the things that happened in our side of a ginger is pain got hijacked for a while by what I would consider people way out on the fringes that, that had no research. They did things that I think may have even harmed what we were trying to do. Um, and I'm not trying to point fingers at people, but we have a professional responsibility. People listening today, may they may like, not like evidence-based practice, but it is our North Star. It tells us where we are. And so, you know, um, I, I was uh, one of the most fortunate therapists in the world. Um, David Butler was my advisor. And um, I remember entering pain science in the 90s when neurodynamics was taught as a, it's a quackery. It was attacked in the journals, but kudos to the people then that put time, money, and effort into the research. And so, yes, some of these things we're mentioning today, five years ago, was basically seen as on the fringes, it's alternative, or it's weird, it's com it, it was at all these terminologies. And so my ask for people that are interested in, 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 uh, in, in lifestyle medicine is keep driving the research because that will... That will keep us on that straight and narrow. The evidence is mind boggling in sleep, in nutrition, in this, because then we can stay to this, this path that I think will happen by itself anyway. Um, that's probably the big thing. I, I think we just need to keep an eye on that. Thank you for yeah mentioning that. Um, I, this, this, is a, this particular question, we could stay on for a while. So uh, I'm gonna try and recap everything that was said. And Brett, please chime in again because um, it's been a while since we circulated all the way around. Um, so I hear, you know, staying in the research, which is important, keep asking good research questions and seeking those out. I hear um, looking at a, a better demonstration of the value of physical therapy services, uh, spe specifically with what the public may perceive, because I don't think they understand that we, we do and can practice integrative and lifestyle uh, medicine techniques um advocacy that's a big one um movement towards what we need to do i think is a shift in mindset of what we see in our profession i don't know how you guys feel about this but i often think that um pts will think of themselves as clinicians and not advocates or activists but as professionals i i think we are obligated to be both um we need to be able to advocate we need to be able to support the people who are creating laws. Otherwise, we don't. Well, I guess the as the phrase goes, if you don't have a seat at, at the table, um, you're on the menu kind of thing. So um, I don't know if you guys have anything else to add, you know, about this, particularly the advocacy piece and what messages you might have for the folks listening about how do they get involved? How do they begin to make a difference? One is set your boundaries and be aware of the dark side of resilience don't push so far that you know you're, you're in burnout and your face is in the windshield but the other part of that is how do they get involved with creating change even at the smallest level so that we do have higher you know perceived value people understand what we do and we do get reimbursed at higher rates yeah to, to draw hop in here um so i, I practice in the state of washington and um, in, since I became licensed back in 2009, uh, we've had to go through legislative battles to uh, earn the right to perform spinal manipulation. And we're currently going through uh, the process to uh, be able to practice 
trigger point dry needling or, or intramuscular uh, needling, as, as we refer to it in this state, uh, when 45 other states can practice it. And the thing that I often hear from physical therapists is, oh, I'm not going to needle or I'm not going to manipulate, so I don't really care. Um, but I think that's besides the point. And I think it's, you've got to look more holistically about your profession and the patients, right? So even if you don't think you're going to use these, these tools or modalities, think of your colleagues and counterparts who may use them and may help a patient and keep a patient from going down the drugs and surgery route. Um, so I think we've got to be advocates for our profession. And it really just starts with being, being a member. Um, and paying attention to what what's going on in your state, it takes very little time to have a voice. And in fact, they make it so easy now that they push it to you through an email, you click a couple buttons and you can email a message to your legislator. Um, you know, if you can't, if you can only dedicate a, a little bit of time, uh, find out when your state legislative day is and you mark that on your calendar and attend that one day. That can be your one day of advocacy and giving back. And I guarantee that the more people that show up at the Capitol, um, the more your legislators hear from physical therapists, the deeper those relationships become. And when you wanna get things done or when somebody's trying to you know, maybe attack something that you're already doing, um, you know, those, we, we can't wait, right? We've gotta be, have this kind of ongoing, consistent uh, advocacy. We can't just show up when we need something. Um, it's kind of like the friend, right? You can't just like be the friend who only calls when you need something, right? That's not going to get things done. You, you need to be there, create those relationships. And so while some people may think it's a lot of time investment, it's really, really minimal. Click a few buttons, show up one day a year, and that's more um, than, than we're doing now um, and would make a huge difference. So absolutely oh my gosh that's why i was doing this i'm like oh you're just speaking my language <laughs> i uh, um am our apta north carolina legislative chair and you've you've just used the script that i use every every day when i'm speaking to dpt programs and trying to get the the students involved it does take less than five minutes of your time so if you're a pt and you're listening um we're speaking to you especially if you're not an apta member I spent several years um, kind of with the notion that, um, oh, what is APTA doing for me? But I think that that's a, a shoddy kind of poor attitude to have, because if we want to create that change, it has to be from the inside out. Oftentimes, we can't just knock on the door, like you mentioned, using the stranger analogy, and ask for something when we're not involved. So we could talk and talk and talk about that. But I just want um, those of you listening to realize that it doesn't take a lot of time. And if you don't know who your legislative chair is in your state, reach out. They will be more than happy to have a quick chat. If you're in North Carolina, that would be me um, to help you get involved. Um, it, it is really a, a minimal commitment because there will be a battle at some point that will personally affect you. And you're going to want to have a seat at the table for that. And Ginger, can I just add a little bit to that? Um, Sam, I mean, we, we talked about, you mentioned the opioid crisis. That has opened a door for us. Like we should be pounding on the door saying, let us in coach. We have solutions. We have, we have such better medicine in movement, in education, in sleep. And so just being proactive and not, not waiting for, not waiting for the invitation on that and get to know just even your very most local representatives and establish some relationships with them before you know it, they'll be, they'll ask if we, you know, get good at your craft and, and, you know, it's, it's scary, but it is so worth it to, to get down and share um, information. I've had some really nice conversations with our state legislature, which started at legislative day, leave your card, say, I teach pain science. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's been really cool. Yes. So yeah, yeah, they absolutely a big foot in the door. It does. They ab absolutely listen. Um, I had a, a bit of a personal experience with that. I, I ran for North Carolina State Senate um, in 2018 and got to know a lot of, of um, the state council uh, as well as um, local representatives along the way. I met a lot of good people all doing this for the right reasons. And they are regular people doing their best, trying to balance legislative and regulatory issues with their 
their, um, their own families, their own jobs. Lots of legislators are part-time. In North Carolina, you guys might be appalled to know that um, the uh, annual salary for a, what is a full-time job is $14,000 a year. So they have to have a full-time job and be a full-time legislator, right? And take and field all these concerns and yet be up and aware on, oh, a spinal manipulation bill, which we got passed a few years ago, dry needling, which we won our case for a few years ago. Um, so if you guys are looking for some input on that, call North Carolina, we can help you out with that. Um, they don't know and they can't possibly know if they have real estate law one day and a physical therapy issue the next, they don't know. They, so they're real people with um, real concerns and they just wanna hear from you and they'll be more than happy to talk to you, particularly if you're a constituent, so. All right, I don't wanna close out this interview without asking a really important question because you guys wrote a fantastic chapter and both Joe Tata and myself felt strongly that an, a, a book on integrative and lifestyle medicine couldn't be published without a pain chapter. So what would you say is your big takeaway? What do you want readers to know about your chapter if you could only give them you know, a couple of points about it? Right, are you going to go first? Because I think we have the same one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, as Ginger said, pain is not usually thought of as a part of lifestyle medicine. Um, and I think, you know, Jesse's probably responsible for this, but, you know, uh, sometimes you have to crawl out of the abyss before you can really start focusing on your health of becoming a more healthy individual. And a lot of these individuals who really could benefit from lifestyle medicine are likely in pain. As we know, there's a high incidence of chronic and persistent pain, persistent pain in this country and around the world. And so um, I think that's really, really, it's a critical component, I view, of lifestyle medicine is how do we address pain? And I think Jesse pointed this out earlier in the call too, that many of the same strategies to take an average person to a more well uh, person are the same strategies that we can use to help somebody kind of crawl out of that abyss of, of pain. So um, there's some gold nuggets um, in, in this chapter that I would highly recommend uh, uh, checking out. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, the, the part that I, you know, maybe it's the other way around. It's everything Brad just said, you know, people in pain have lifestyle issues and vice versa. The techniques that work for lifestyle medicine works for pain. Um, the one part I just would like the readers to understand is that um, teaching people about pain, pain neuroscience education by itself is utterly useless. We know that. Uh, we published papers for the last five years. You cannot explain pain out of somebody. I've tried. Trust me, it doesn't work. Um, all that pain neuroscience education does, it, it reduces fear. It um, reduces catastrophization, which gives them hope. And now that they've got hope and they have less fear, they move more. And what makes them better is movement. And so it just irks me when I see all the social media activity about PE doesn't work um, because they're not because they don't understand PE. &E. PE &E is, just, is it's just a tool to set you up for success. What makes you better is the movement part. It's the behavioral aspects, and that's why you know um, PE &E plus is basically a, be, a for lack of a better term is cognitive behavioral therapy approach to a person in pain, but it's the behavioral part, the movement, the exercise, the sleep, the nutrition, all those things that matter as well. Yeah, and I, I guess the only last thing I would add on to that, and it's probably the reason many of us love our profession, is we get to work with healing humans. <laughs> humans, we're all on that journey. And so that personal connection um, that we make, that therapeutic alliance, that trust, that's part of the therapeutic experience. And um, that's my favorite part. And I think it's so foundational. Um, Adrian always throws around the quote from, um, I think it's Theodore Roosevelt's, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so if we just bring our caring hearts and our knowledge and our curiosity to the encounter, um, there's a lot of hope. There's so much hope for people who are hurting and there's so many tools. We just get to help, you know, guide them, let them give them the autonomy to help choose which tool is going to be the right fit for them. And there's just a lot of hope, which makes it exciting and fun. That's such a, a lovely point to end on is, um, you know, I think it was Dr. Elizabeth Dean said, why, you, why wouldn't you wanna be a part of the most powerful profession in the world where we can you know, um, use such um, powerful modalities that are such low cost and low tech and exact such a profound change. 
that overall, um, it goes back to what you were saying, we increase hope and we decrease fear. And the overlap of P and E and ILM together are incredibly powerful things. Um, so I have one last question to ask, because when I, this is so inspiring to me, when, when I feel inspired, I start thinking about um, fun and play. And one of the things I love to do is music. So a really silly question to finish up, which is what song do you think kind of represents what you do from your point of view? I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. You like to move it, move it. Move it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that song. It reminds me of Madagascar because yeah. they played it on Madagascar. Yeah, that was so good. My kids were little when that movie came out. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a song? Right, you're the music guy, isn't it? <laughs> oh. you know, I, I, I said I'm I'm not really the biggest uh, music person, but when I think about just kind of the current state and um, you know maybe where we can head more, the the song that came to me is uh, "Big Yellow Taxi," um, which is Counting Crows, originally written by Joni Mitchell. Um, but really the line, you know, they pay paradise to put up a parking lot and really speaks to me in kind of our current culture of like wanting more and, um, you know, kind of sometimes, you know, forgetting the simple and the basic, right, which is just health, right? Um, so we're, we're kind of overlooking health and just throwing pills and injections and surgery, you know, at our health, um, trying to use those things to fix us. Uh, when in fact, maybe the beauty is already there that we're human beings. And that if we just kind of do the right things um, and we use providers to maybe help coach us along that journey, uh, we might have more long lasting success um, and, and, and also find maybe more happiness um, in, in general. So that's kind of the song that kind of resonated with me when, when you asked this question. I was just bopping the, that on the way to the clinic last week. <laughs> As I turned right into the clinic, I was uh, I got to the parking lot phrase in that song. Yeah, that is so true because our system is is not currently it's malaligned for the values of integrative and lifestyle medicine, and what we're out there doing, what you guys are out there doing. Um, what we are collectively doing as, as physical therapists is coming full circle to be able to treat those you know original issues, which is, I think, where medicine began. Not in the for profit and all aligned system we have now, so I want to thank you for all being here for spending this time um, with me talking about everything, not just your amazing book chapter and and I wish you all the best of luck in your future endeavors. Um, thank you. Thank you. Ginger.